any comments or questions about last time when we worked up the, the second major and without which we wouldn't be alive today contribution to the modern world, electromagnetism. And all the things that we, we, we take for granted that came out of electricity and magnetism and finally the integration of that into electromagnetism that enables all the stuff that we call the modern world came out of the 19th century. <clears throat> so today we're going to jump a little bit ahead of ourselves because we need to, to see how important was the work of one man. Then we're going to get into quantum mechanics, which involves a whole bunch of people and a lot more time to understand it because it's so bizarre, a model, a theory, an analysis, an understanding, that you have to step back and look at quantum mechanics uh, as a special, a special thing, as different uh, from all that's gone before it since it is so very different from everyday experience, it, it, takes, it takes some careful, careful treatment. So I want to get into Einstein today, and you will also see that he does his bit to kick off uh, quantum mechanics himself. So, all right, let's, let's do that. Any comments? Kick off everything. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we're going to do. Because yeah. without Einstein, and you wouldn't even be here in the College of Optics. Why? Why one? Huh? Quantization of light. Quantization of light, yeah. What else? What else? Do you use it? Huh? Rate the rate equations, yes. In particular, what? Laser. Lasers, of course. You wouldn't have an understanding of lasers without it. Stimulated, Stimulated and spontaneous emission. He quantized those two ideas and it enables you to, to write down things. And he shows that spontaneous emission is simply the lifetime. And he gives you a way of looking at it. So you can see that high frequency transitions have very short lifetimes. And right away, you know that those are going to be hard devices to make. OK. So we owe Einstein some, some stuff. But first, we have to understand a little bit of why we, got, why we have to look at Einstein. First of all, the essence of science, and we've said this before, science differs from religion in that science deals with what can be measured or quantified. And if you're going to measure stuff, you really need standards of measurement. You need to be able to say that, that we all agree on what the standard units are. And it turns out that in science, you only need three things. You need a distance, a unit of time, and a unit of mass. Now, you probably aren't used to that thought, and so I'll spell it out in more detail. In order to do science, you only need a unit of length, which today we call the meter. In the United States, we call it a foot, but that's just because we're a bit behind the times. Time is given in the second, and mass as the kilogram. All other units are derived from those three. You have any challenges to that? It usually brings out oh. hmm? charge. Charge? You electric, sure? Electric charge, you can't really get from that. You sure? It would be difficult, okay. and I can't think of a way to do it. Of course. OK, let's, let's, let me take up the challenge. OK, we're going we're gonna to show the charge is derivable from just those three units. OK, and you'll pay me a nickel if I can get it right. I'll give you a quarter. A quarter? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> For that, I'll do it with my right hand since I'm left-handed. <laughs> OK. All right, let's go back to Coulomb's law. Force equals charge times charge. Q1. Let's, let's use equal charges. It doesn't matter. And remember, he's got a constant over here that makes the units of force on both sides. OK, divided by distance squared. OK. Uh, so we have newtons over here. Now, what are newtons? Force is given as kilograms, kilograms, meters, huh? meters, squared. meters times distance squared. Oh, so okay. 
Uh, pardon me. Yeah, time squared. Yeah, I'm so so anxious to win my quarter. Mm -hmm. that, uh, okay, times time squared divided by time squared equals units of charge squared divided by distance squared. Let's call it meters squared. Okay. There it is. Charge squared equals uh, kilogram meter cubed divided by time squared. So charge squared, charge itself, is given as kilogram meter cubed over time squared, whole quantity to the one half power. They're inconvenient. It's not easy to do. You don't want to solve your equations carrying units that look like that. But it's not hard to, to give units of charge and units of mass, length, and time. So you owe me a quarter, which I'll give back to you. Fair That's all right. Uh, don't you need the, uh, the normalizing constant? Yeah, you could put it in, but the normalizing constant already takes care of these units, too. <laughs> Sorry, keep it. Um, the, other, the other unit that people usually ask about is temperature. Okay, but you also remember one half kT squared equals one half mv squared. It's very easy to get that one in terms of these units. And other things, you can go through, there are books and things that are written about various unit, not books, but tables of unit equivalents and one related to the other and so on. And ultimately, you can put them in terms of these three units. Now, I didn't say it was easy to do physics or science in just those three units, but that's all you need. Okay? So if anybody ever comes up to you late at night and says, what's the units of this? You say, well, in, in, in meters, kilograms, and seconds, or in more convenient units. But you can always get them in those three units. Okay? So anyway. You can you can you can do it. These these are these are all you need. Now, we've moved away from the iridium bar and the iridium kilogram kept in Paris. We have other ways of of defining what the what the unit of length is and the unit of the second. Then, which used to be some rather strange things because we didn't have anything better, but now we use a, a cesium. Uh, uh, is it cesium or rubidium now? I don't, I don't remember, but some oscillation frequency of a cesium atom used to be the, the second to... to I think I made an aluminum one recently. Aluminum? I think so. Wait, wait. I think they made an aluminum atomic clock recently. Okay, well, I don't know which one is better yet, but, but they're in the eighth decimal place of this oscillation frequency is called a second. Uh, and the meter is some wavelength of something. And uh, I forgot now they do the kilogram nowadays, but you can look it up. Anyway, all the theories in physics are actually set up so that the units work out to be the same on both sides of the equation. That turns out to be another feature of the, the science that, that has gone on ever since. So for example, Newton's mechanics. You all, you all remember that, right? Nobody forgets that, never. Uh, <clears throat> And, and it's simply Newton's connecting the response of an object having a mass m measured in kilograms. Now, in his day and age, it was measured in whatever, slubs, I think, uh, <clears throat> to the application of a force. Uh, now and, and, and what would happen is you apply a force to a mass, and its velocity would change. And I say velocity because speed is a magnitude and velocity is a vector. Uh, and it would accelerate at so many meters per second per second. And in fact, what Newton had done in this equation is define the units of f. He said the units of f are mass times the time rate of change of velocity, which is meters per second per second. That unit is now called the Newton. It's just easier to write Newton than it is to write kilogram meters per time squared. That's a pain in the neck. f as Newton's is much easier. Okay, but it does let us get units of charge in these weird units. Okay, so, but Newton at a deeper level did something that was, at his time, conceptually nice, 
but led to a problem. What he said was there is some universal reference frame against which all measurements can be referenced. And it seemed nice because he was living in the 17th century and everybody needed some, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, they wanted an absolute reference with which to measure everything. Yes, but, but the, the sense of the century was stability and, and absolute monarchies and, and stability was a key thing. And Newton put that together in his, in his model of the universe that there was some kind of universal reference frame so that everything could be measured against it. It was called the ether. It came to be known as the ether and it was massless frictionless, undistortable, and it, it, it was something through which all objects moved. And by the way, there's some argument nowadays that we might be coming back to that as the Higgs field, which is what gives particles their mass. And there may be such a thing, we're not, nobody's arguing for it just yet, but there's talk about it. I'm not going to discuss it. And I don't want to bring it up and don't anybody mention it um, because we'll, we'll get very confused. Okay, Newton's mechanics and all that follows, thermodynamics, the Industrial Revolution, the ascendance of the West, the modern world, uh, and everything else comes from this assumption. And, and this assumption doesn't, um, doesn't really produce any real problems because everything that happens in all of this takes place here on the Earth at very low speed. But it turns out the assumption is wrong. It is fundamentally flawed and that will come about when people try to test it, which is what physics and what science is about. You make a suggestion like Newton did and well, why not try and see if it's for real? Let's see if it's right. So along with the advent of electromagnetics, which is the work as we discussed last week of all these guys and many others, you find out that you've got these things called electromagnetic waves and they propagate through the universe at the speed of light. Can you use the speed of light to measure the Earth's motion through the ether? Is that possible? You now have a tool, you have the speed of light, you have these electromagnetic waves that are moving through the ether, can you use those waves to measure the Earth's motion through the ether? So that's, that's now something that you start thinking about and you need a very bright young man whose work we're going to talk about in more detail later on in the course named Albert Michelson. He's a professor, by the time he does this experiment, he's a professor at Case University in Cleveland and he invents an optical device which we talked about when we discussed the LIGO experiments uh, and again we'll talk about those again later on. Uh, Michelson built, invents an interferometer which we're still using today which is nothing more than you taking a, micro, a monochromatic light source, you split the intensity or the, the power in the beam, sending half of it this way, half of it that way, you bring them back together and you should see fringes if you're good and if you've said your prayers and you've gotten up on the right side of the bed and all that good stuff you'll see fringes. It, I've left out some of the details here which you will see in more detail when we do it but basically that's a Michelson interferometer. So what Michelson says is I've got this idea of an interferometer with two different length paths and if I put one of them in the direction that the earth is moving and the other is perpendicular to it. And then I sit here looking at the fringes and I rotate this so that now this one is perpendicular to the motion and this one is in the direction of the motion. The distance, the, the, the effect of the Earth's motion should show up as a change in the fringe pattern. Okay? That's a pretty cool thought. So he floats his interferometer in a pool of mercury and he hopes he doesn't go crazy because mercury is what people who make hats use to shape the hats. 
and they typically go mad. It's called Hatter's, Mad Hatter's Disease. And if anyone has ever read uh, Alice in Wonderland, you know about the Mad Hatter. And if you haven't read Alice in Wonderland, you should go read it. It's very entertaining, uh, and it's a sort of a fun escape from all the science we're throwing at you. Uh, but anyway, uh, he says, point one arm in the direction of the Earth's movement around the sun, and you watch the fringes as you rotate this interferometer. You could also do the experiment, for example, you could do it in uh, December, in January, again in, in, in uh, June, again in, in December, again in, and so on, as the Earth goes around, not rotating it, and just see. Because remember, as the Earth moves around, this arm which points in the direction uh, a few months later is, is perpendicular to the direction of the motion, and so on as you go around the Earth. But wanting to get the data better, and also to get some vibration insulation, he built this massive device and floated it in a pool of mercury. And you should see changes in the fringes as you, as, as you, uh, as the Earth's motion would alter the light speed in the arms of the interferometer. Okay, that was his hypothesis, that you would see this, and guess what? You already knew the answer, there were no changes. The fringes did not change as, as, he, uh, as, as you rotated it. Now there's two explanations, okay? One is that the Earth was not moving. Now we know that's wrong, the Earth is moving. The other explanation is the speed of light did not change according to the motion of the light source. Now, you ruled out the first, so the second one has to be the assumption, has to be the true explanation that the speed of light did not depend on the light source. In other words, no matter which way the light source was going, the speed of light was always the speed of light. But that violated Newton's assumption of the universal reference frame. In Newton's assumption, which is called essentially Galilean relativity, you would have to assume that if the source, let's say my, my, my pointer is moving this way, the speed of light would be the speed of light plus the speed of my motion. But it isn't, it's just C. It doesn't matter whether I'm moving or not, it's just C. C. That's the implication. Light travels at a speed independent of motion through the reference frame so why do we need that assumption that there is such a reference frame? Why do we need it? That's coming out of the Michelson experiment. Now he does this experiment sometime around 1875, give or take a little bit. We'll get the right date later on in the course. But there are, of course, as there always are in science, an attempt. Yeah, hold on. Can you pass that over to him? Does that assumption only apply when light is traveling in vacuum? Because, I mean, if there is this weird thing that they is low light to like kilometers per second, like meters per second or something, it, there doesn't apply, no? You can like follow the light in some kind of media that light is like slowed down or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're asking about the experiments that have been done in the last 20 or so years, 20 or 30 years, to slow light down. You can slow light down, all right, by, by adjusting the, the um, index of refraction. You can't speed it up. You can't make it go faster than C. You can slow it down. And that's done by, by choosing the index of refraction of the material. Um, and reasons for slowing it down are it gives you some fundamental ex experiments you can try. Um, yeah. It's probably worth mentioning that even if you slow down uh, the, the light speed or the phase velocity or what have you of the light, uh, you're still not affecting, you know, not being able to add your light source's speed to the speed of the wave itself. Yeah, you can't. That's what, yeah, that's, that's what I said. You can't speed it up. You can slow it down, but you can't speed it up. Yeah, there's a classic device that's built inside a block of um, 
of material, uh, uh, gyroscope, uh, laser gyroscope that has two, propag uh, two waves propagating in opposite directions. This is another test of the Michelson-Morley experiment. The speed of light is not C. It's not the speed in the vacuum. It's the speed of light inside the glass. But it's still independent of direction of the source. And in fact, <coughs> uh, the, the fringes that you do get from that are related to that independence. There's a change in frequency, but not a change in speed. Yeah. So actually, actually we make use of the fact in, in these gyroscopes. So. As usual, people try to save the model. Once the word was out about Michelson's experimental results, and when we discuss the experiment itself, you will see how hard it was for Michelson to actually report a null result. When you go and do an experiment and the answer comes out, I didn't get an answer, I didn't get a result, it's very hard to say I didn't get a result. It takes him four pages of discussion before he says there's no change in the speed of light no matter which way, which way the arms are pointing. Anyway, when the results come out, Lorenz in Holland and Fitzgerald in Ireland suggest that maybe the arm in the direction that the Earth was moving got shorter. Well, that's kind of an arbitrary ad hoc assumption uh, to, to explain why, why the change wasn't there. And now actually, except for Star Trek and Star Wars and some other science fiction stories, that actually does happen. You do see change in length happen. But proposing this transformation rules, Lorenz didn't do anything to deal with the fundamental problem. He just gave some ad hoc explanation. There seemed to be no universal reference frame. And why did this happen? And what did it mean? Was the universe so unlike our expectations? And uh, actually, other things start to happen. As the speed approaches the, that of light, you actually get squeezed, and you become more massive, and you age more slowly. All of these things will be explained in a moment. So I want to build up the tension a little bit, you know, drum roll. Uh, blinking of the lights and all that, and enter Albert Einstein, OK? This is, this is one of the more amazing, amazing people in the, in the history of the human race. Uh, 1879 to 1955, arguably the most brilliant scientist that ever lived. Uh, Newton is close, but Einstein has to have a little bit of an edge simply because he was dealing with something much deeper and more all-encompassing. And I'll, I'll get to that. But in 1905, when he's 26 years old, he publishes four papers in Annalen der Physik. He's no more than a patent clerk in, the Bern, uh, in Bern, Switzerland, in the patent office. By the way, he was later quoted as saying, it was a great place to work because I could deal with all these patents in the morning and I could do my real stuff in the afternoon. Uh, he publishes four papers, one that explains Brownian motion of particles, one that explains the photoelectric effect, one explains special relativity. That is relativity between uh, um, reference frames that are not accelerating with respect to each other, but that are moving at constant speed with respect to each other. Uh, and one explains the mass energy equivalence. Now, this one and this one are in support of quantum mechanics. These involve the 1900 papers by Max Planck in which he introduces the photon and changes, well, it's only been 97 years since Thomas Young proves that light is a wave phenomenon. And all of a sudden, 97 years later, it's particles. And Einstein uses the particle concept to do these two items. These two are going to change the way human beings view themselves in the universe. These two 
Any one of those four would win him a Nobel Prize. He could have gotten four Nobel Prizes, one for each of these. Turns out that the one that he gets his Nobel Prize for is the second one. And the reason that eventually comes out is that the Nobel Committee was not quite sure if it understood these and his later work on general relativity. So they give it to him for this and contributions to theoretical physics. That's the way they phrase his Nobel award. Anyway, the paper on special relativity is a major turning point in the history of physics. So now we have to say we live in a Newtonian world embedded in an Einsteinian universe because the corrections of special relativity and the mass energy equivalents occur at very high speeds, close to the speed of light. Now that one is going to change the politics of the world. It's going to affect how we view our military attitudes. It's the way you make nuclear weapons. And it surely shortened World War II, but it has made us live under the threat of, of, of nuclear weapons ever since. Yeah. The mass energy equivalence was also a giant stepping block to understanding the energy source from the sun and how it could burn for billions of years, uh, given its mass and the rate of energy generation, et cetera. Until that time, uh, it was unsettled science for sure. Yeah, uh, correct. And it may actually lead someday to uh, an actual workable fusion energy system here on the planet. Uh, the the uh, Stellarator confinement systems are showing signs that they might actually work long enough to confine a fusion reaction that could lead to a, a real fusion energy uh, uh, power source. Well, we shall see. But meanwhile, this has explained how the sun works, of course. It's also what leads, with a little kick from Einstein, to the Manhattan Project that leads to the bombs in World War II. OK, so what is Einstein's background? Let's find out a little bit where this guy comes from and what makes him such an unusual uh, person who by himself, working essentially alone, uh, overturns 500 years of, of, uh, of, of understanding. He, he comes from a German Jewish family gives you a little sense of background. He really hates the rote model of learning in, in, in German schools, simply because his mind is capable of a much broader approach to things. He's willing to think outside the box, if you will. But contrary to legend, which says he was a bad student, he wasn't. He was just a decent student. He got his grades all right. Um, and that's mainly because he was so brilliant, he could not pay a lot of attention, but still get his, get his grades. Uh, he just didn't like doing what he didn't like. Uh, and that was going to these schools. But even as a young child, he was very curious about how things worked. That is, he, he would like to take things apart and put them together and so on. And for a while, his family moved to Italy where relatives had a little company making electrical machines, motors, generators. Uh, relays, what have you. And he was very interested in how they worked. And of course, he couldn't take them apart, and put them together, because these were being made to be sold. So he began to do thought experiments in his head, experiments that said, well, if, if, if the, the electric power were given to the coil that would pull down the magnet, it would make the, the switch bar raise up, it would stop the circuit, it would, he would begin to figure out things in his head. And he began to use these thought experiments to increase his own understanding. It also gave him a, a, a powerful tool in the future for how he understood things without actually physically doing experiments. So his professional history, see that handsome guy over there? 
He was also a, a womanizer. He chased every woman he could possibly uh, chase. Uh, but but that's another part of the story. Um, I can't speak for his uh, moral fiber. I'm speaking about him being a scientist. So anyway, in 1901, he gets his diploma at the Polytechnic in Zurich, and he becomes a Swiss citizen. He's trained to teach in physics, but he can't get a position because his, his, uh, his advisors are not so thrilled with him. He just kind of barely gets his, his, his degree. But he takes a position as a, as a patent examiner in the patent office, and 1905 gets his PhD and publishes those four papers in the year called the Miracle Year. It's got an Itali a, a, a Latin name, Annalis Mirabilis, which I'm sure I've mangled the pronunciation, but it's the year of miracles, or the miracle year. Uh, and in 2005, there was celebrations all over the world for the 100th anniversary of that year. Uh, because of those papers, the University of Bern finally wakes up to the fact that they've got a genius on their hands right there in the patent office. And so they hire him as a, a, a private docent. I'm not sure what that status would mean here in, in, in the States, what's the equivalent but it's probably somewhere around uh, an associate professor. It's my best guess. 1909, he's a professor extraordinaire at the University in Zurich. 1911, he's a theoretical physics professor at the University of Prague. Uh, and I don't know whether I'm going to actually get there, but while in Prague, he becomes involved with um, a, a group of uh, radical thinkers. Um, uh, one of them is Franz Kafka. Um, one of them, uh, others are, are um, again, people thinking about uh, socialism, uh, changes in, in the structure of the world, and so on. Uh, not that he ever buys into uh, ca uh, communism or socialism, it's just that he hangs out with this group of uh, intellectuals in Prague. A year later, just one year, he comes back to the, to the professorship of theoretical physics in Zurich, and then Max Planck comes to comes to Zurich and tells him, Albert, I have for you the most prestigious position in the world of European science. It is the position that I hold, the professor of theoretical physics at the University of Berlin. I'm retiring. And you will also be the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Physical Institute, but you have to become a German citizen. Well, that sounds pretty good. So Einstein goes to Berlin, and World War I breaks out. So he's now in Germany in a militaristic society. Everybody's marching off to war. Uh, and he is uh, uh, in Berlin doing what he can in the way of science. Uh, He's not happy with some of the German scientists who are actively aiding the war, working on chemical warfare, uh, working on improved explosives, and who knows what else. In 1921, after the war, when a lot of his earlier work, as I said, was now demonstrated experimentally and so on, uh, and in fact, as I'll tell you in a few moments, his, his uh, general relativity had been demonstrated beyond just the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, his, his ideas about bending light by gravity works. Uh, he is got given a Nobel Prize. And then in 1933, he comes to the United States and becomes professor of theoretical physics at Princeton. Why 1933? Just speak up loudly. Yeah, it's when Hitler took the, the, the power in, in Germany, no? Yeah. And why does Einstein leave? Right, Einstein was from a Jewish family. He was never a, 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 a practicing Jew. He didn't go to synagogue. He didn't uh, uh, you know, do that. But he was definitely identified as a Jew. Another historical political context was uh, Einstein did his work uh, 
and he was in Germany. World War Two was World War One was going on. Uh, Maxwell, of course, was British, and the British were fighting the Hun, and uh, it was unaccepted until a British person actually made the measurement of the bending of light at a total uh, eclipse. Was it was okay to start thinking that Einstein was an okay guy, even if you were British? Yeah, yeah I'm going to do that. Right now. It's okay. Uh, you're right because. Uh, there was a, a, st a well, well, we'll get to it in, in a couple minutes, but what MJ is talking about is that Arthur Eddington uh, was one of the few people in the world that, of whom it was said, understood Einstein's general relativity. And Eddington, as you'll see in a moment, led a, a, an expedition to uh, measure the bending of light by the sun's gravitational field. Anyway, a little more about Einstein's personal person. Uh, Mileva Maric, and that's a, uh, an Eastern European name with, with dots over the sea, and I'm not sure I can pronounce that correctly, was the only female physics student in his class. She was quite a bright woman but, and very interesting, but she never passed her PhD exams. They got married, they had two children, and then intellectually and uh, lover-wise, they drifted apart. Uh, when he went to Berlin in, in, in 1914, uh, he struck up a relationship with Elsa Einstein, a cousin of his, and uh, that relationship made his marriage get worse, and uh, things went downhill from there. His reconnection with Elsa, uh, she was, you know, your, your wifely kind of woman, not in any way competitive, not the kind of woman who would challenge him in any way. Uh, and he then said to Maleva, he said, look, you should not speak to me unless I speak to you first. Uh, and don't bother me, don't come into my study, don't come into my bedroom, if, unless I talk to you. You know, this is the kind of person he was with respect to Maleva at this time. Uh, anyway, he makes an agreement with the help of uh, a very famous chemist in Germany at that time, uh, who was also working on war issues for the German government. But he helps negotiate a divorce. And Einstein promises Maleva he'll, she will get his Nobel Prize money. It's 1915, 1914. He hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet. It's six years before. He's so confident that he's going to win a Nobel Prize, he puts this agreement in his, in his divorce agreement. That Beleva will get the Nobel Prize money. And she does get the Nobel Prize money, uh, but she's gone back to Bern to live with their children. Uh, and what she does, she buys a couple of apartment buildings, and it turns out to be a very sad existence for her. Uh, the buildings are not profitable, they take a lot of maintenance, and she has a difficult uh, life after that. Meanwhile, Einstein and Elsa uh, get, get on very well because she's the kind of, of, of life that he wants. She's just very supportive, she doesn't give him any trouble, and they get on quite well. Now, special relativity is based on only two assumptions, that there's no absolute frame of reference, and that all observers in their own reference frames, moving with, with respect to each other, must arrive at the same laws of physics. Well, that seems pretty easy assumption to make. Specifically, and the easiest way to state that is that they each must get the same value for the speed of light in a vacuum. That is. It's a universal constant, so says Einstein. Assuming that the speed of light is absolute and unvarying, Einstein is forced to, to conclude that space and time are relative. That is, each observer getting the same speed of light means that the, 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 the reference frames are relative to each other. You can't have an absolute reference frame. He claimed at the early outset that he didn't know about the Michelson-Morley results. 
Now, it's kind of hard to believe that because just two years after his special relativity paper, Michelson becomes the first American to win a Nobel Prize, and he wins it for the experiments that he did. So it's a little hard to take Einstein's claim uh, at face value. And when we, when we talk about Michelson uh, uh, later on in the course, uh, you will see that Einstein eventually makes the remark that um, he says to Professor Michelson that, you know, we, we all needed your results. They were brilliant, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the early remarks that he didn't know of those results are hard to accept, at least for me. Okay, I can't believe that he didn't know about this, and two years later the guy gets a Nobel Prize for just the stuff that Einstein said he didn't know about. So, so much for that claim. Now, the results of, gen of, of special relativity. The length in the direction of motion gets shorter. Well, that's clearly demonstrated. Time slows down as you move near the speed of light. We've done those experiments. And you might say, how do we do those experiments? You take, an, uh, if you will, a, 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 an, an atom that has a known lifetime in, when it's still, and you accelerate it in an accelerator. And you accelerate it to high speed, approaching the speed of light, and the lifetime gets longer. It doesn't decay as quickly. Its clock has slowed down. Its clock is its lifetime. Mass and energy are related by that equation. Guess what? That's why the sun lasts as long as it does, and that is the energy source in your, your nuclear weapons and your nuclear power plants, and maybe someday in, in fusion power plants. And we had to rewrite the first law of thermodynamics, because it's not just energy or mass that's conserved, it's mass energy. Oh, and this is the one that the science fiction people can never get in their heads, is that you can never travel faster than the speed of light. These predictions have been tested experimentally, and they've never failed, except in science fiction. And after Einstein, all physical theories have to be relativistically invariant if they're going to be of any use. That is, theories that involve atoms and, and, and things that move fast, like electrons whirring around atoms and so on. There's another consequence as well, and that's the asynchronization of clocks. There's a fundamental limit. Which no, that's, you can do that from special relativity. Asynchronization of clocks. You can, you cannot absolutely synchronize clocks at arbitrary distances from each other. In fact, the only way you can synchronize them exactly is if they're at the same place. Yeah. That's the pole vaulter experiment, yeah. by the way. Okay. That's correct. I stand corrected. Yeah. So there are consequences to to his to his special relativity work. And now I, I want to point out the way he thought. He thinks through thought experiments, and this is kind of a fun one. He says, suppose I were on the rear platform of a train. We don't have trains anymore, so it's hard to have this kind of thought experiment. But he says, suppose I'm on the rear platform of a train looking at a clock in the train station. So there's Einstein looking at a clock. Okay? And the train in my watch and the clock would measure the same time intervals. So if the train is moving away from the clock at some speed, the light from the clock takes a certain amount of time to reach him. So he sees the clock at an earlier time than his watch is telling him. So according to Einstein on the back of the train, the clock is running a little bit slower, right? It hasn't ticked off as much time as his watch. Now take it to an extreme. If he were moving at the speed of light, c, the only he was moving away from the clock at the time at, at the speed of light, the light from the clock that reaches him is the light that left the clock the instant he moved by he started to move. No other light catches up with him because he's moving at the speed of light. 
So he thinks the clock has stopped. Just reverse that a little bit, and you discover that if the clock moves away from him at the speed of light, that clock is, is stopped. So your observation of a clock that's moving at the speed of light is that it has stopped. So time slows down and stops when you're moving at the speed of light. From this simple little thought experiment about what would a clock look like if I were on a train moving away from it. That's the way the man thought. And it's a very powerful tool in, in thinking about an experiment that you may want to do. So keep it in mind. It's a very powerful thing. OK. It's worth noting that Einstein's concept of a beautiful and, and simple and beautiful set of laws to govern the universe might pass for certitude. Actually, it led to a 20th century of change and loss of causality. And for contributing to both relativity and quantum mechanics, he was both loved and reviled because he disturbed people's peace of mind for his brilliant contributions. Now, let's move on. General relativity. So after 1905, he goes to Prague. He comes back to Switzerland. Max Planck recruits him. In 1916, at the height of World War I, he publishes his theory of general relativity. It's relativity when you're in an accelerating reference frame. Gravity is an accelerating reference frame. Things in the presence of gravity are being accelerated by the gravitational force. Well, in fact, it turns out Einstein is going to say there is no gravitational force. There is a bending of space-time by the presence of masses. So every time you weigh yourself or you walk around, just remember you're bending space-time. Okay? And as a result, he says, gravity is going to bend light. Light is going to follow a path through the bent, the distorted space-time, distorted by large, massive objects. Well, as we said earlier, in 1919, after World War I, Arthur Eddington goes off on, a, on an expedition, which we will discuss in more detail at another time. And, and he measures the bending of light exactly as Einstein had predicted it. In, in 1916, Einstein uses his theory of general relativity to, to analyze the motion of the perihelion of the planet Mercury, the, uh, the precession of the perihelion. Perihelion MJ is what? The large the large axis or the small? It's, uh, uh, it's the small. The small axis? Small. Okay. That axis is moving as Mercury goes around the sun. The large one does too. Yeah, but but anyway, it, it was it, yeah. But they, they they were everybody was debating why was it moving the way it did. They couldn't get it right. Einstein publishes general relativity and he calculates exactly the the precession of the perihelion which gave some, 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 some credit to general relativity, but it wasn't until Eddington went off and measured the bending of light in an experiment, uh, an observation that looks something like this. If you're on the Earth and you measure the location of a star somewhere in the sky, and then you measure its position when the sun is close to the the, 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 the uh, path of light from that star to you, and the moon eclipses the sun so you don't have to get blocked out, it will appear as though the star is shifted over because the light from the sun gets bent as it passes, the, pardon me, the light from the star gets bent as it passes by the sun. So because it gets bent, the star appears in that dashed position over a little bit that way. Now, the amount of bending is very small because the sun is not a hugely massive object on a, on a universal scale. The sun's big, but it's not as big as some things. Black holes are a lot bigger, ma more massive. But if you do it right, and you're Arthur Eddington and you're in the right place, you find out that Albert was right. Light is actually bent when it passes close to a massive object like the sun. And when we talk about his experiment in detail, uh, you will find out that his results 
are the result of one photographic plate on which he saw something that looked like the proper amount of bending. Uh, other people in the years following Eddington's experiment got measurements made that in fact confirmed it even more precisely, more detailed, uh, but it was Eddington that got it first. Anyway, Einstein goes on to say, well, there can be very massive objects where the mass is so great that uh, at a certain distance, actually Schwarzschild is responsible for these calculations, that if you cross the boundary in your mass, an object, you get sucked in. You can't get out. Gravity is so strong. If you're not only if you're a particle, but if you're light too. And then there's a problem. When you go inside, it's so strong that you get sucked in to a place of infinite density. That's a singularity. And as far as we're concerned, singularities are very bad. We don't like them. And ever since, people have been trying to get rid of that singularity or singularities like that. And they've been unable to do it. Gravity is a very, general relativity is a very, very good theory. It does not yield itself to being quantized as quantum mechanics has, a, has been fixed several times to get rid of singularities in quantum mechanics. But anyway, one of the things that happens if light goes past a, a black hole or and doesn't enter the cross cross the boundary, it gets bent around. And it gets bent around the other way. And that leads to a very curious phenomenon. And that is something called, oh, the batteries are gone, something called multiple image, images, Einstein rings, and measures of distance. Now, turn the lights out just for a moment so you can see this. There are really are, if you, just in the sketch, if you have a massive gal galaxy and there's a quasar behind it, the electromagnetic radiation coming from the quasar goes around the galaxy going out that way, but the galaxy bends that light. And so in effect, you can get several images of the quasar. You can even get a ring called an Einstein ring. And you know what? It really happens. Here they are. And I, Einstein rings and, and really photographed. I've been trying as hard as I can to see if I see multiple images. I think these two might be two images of one something or other on the other side of that galaxy. But uh, I, I, it doesn't say. It has two as well. Yeah, there are two. Where? Oh, yeah, here and here. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes a real astronomer to, to read these things. But uh, anyway, you see that this stuff is for real. Einstein is proven right every time we look at it. Every time we take a, a test of what he's done, it, it's there. He's been proven correct. Now, new concepts. Einstein has said and has shown in all his work that the universe is four-dimensional. Three space and one time dimension called space-time. Gravity is not a force, but a deformation in space-time that results from the presence of mass. So here, again, can I turn the light off and see the heat a little better? Okay. Um, uh, so here's the Earth, space-time to make it easier to see is reduced to a two-dimensional thing like a trampoline, and it's deformed by the mass of the Earth. Now, when we're talking about uh, uh, gravitational waves, to, to help you get a mental image of it, because you really can't imagine four dimensions, imagine pulling the Earth away instantly. This deformation will snap back, and it will oscillate, and waves will travel out that trampoline-like surface. Now, 
forget your ability to visualize two-dimensional things and realize that in four-dimensional space that happens too. And that's what the LIGO system detected last September, those oscillations in four-dimensional <coughs> space showing up as a change in the length of the, uh, the, the interferometer. So Einstein got it right. Now, way out in the theory of things is string theory, which says that uh, particles are not particles, but tiny strings. And different particles are different modes of vibration of the strings. And to account for the property of the strings and the way they interact, the theorists have introduced 11 dimensional universe, four that we experience and seven that we don't, because they're rolled up so small that we can't detect them. Uh, so far, there's no experimental or observational test of string theory, so it remains just that, uh, a bunch of mathematics. Uh, and someday, maybe, they will suggest something that can be tested, and then we, we, we might be able to test it. Uh, the thing that I find fascinating is that ever since Einstein, we can go back and we can look at what our universe might have been at the beginning and how it evolved to where it is today. Well, at first Einstein said, when, when he knew, when he found out that his, his equations led to an expanding universe, he said, oh, it can't be right. Uh, so he put in a term called uh, the, the uh, uh, cosmic, cosmological constant to, to stop the universe from expanding. Then when he found out the universe really was expanding, that, that Hubble had seen it, he said, that was my biggest mistake. Well, it turns out the universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating. And we're not quite sure what that is, why it's ex accelerating. We gave it a name called uh, 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 dark energy, uh, and, and maybe, maybe that is really there. But anyway, it, it's not static. It started, the expand, it started around 128 billion years ago. At the time of the creation, gravity and all the forces were unified into one force. Almost immediately, gravity separated. And today, the other, there are now four fundamental forces, a strong nuclear, weak nuclear, electromagnetic, and gravity, which is still not, uh, um, we don't understand how it combines with the others. Uh, gravity, however, uh, is not yet quantized. Einstein's theory is so good and so elegant and works so well that it, 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 it stays a classical theory. Classical meaning it's a continuous theory, continuum not quantized. Uh, it eloquently describes what we see and it defies quantization. The problem is these infinities, these singularities that occur at the centers of black holes and such other volumes. The problem is that was the universe at the equal zero, which is very dense and very hot. It was made up of energy. There were no particles yet. So you didn't have to worry about things happening on super light speed times, right? If there's no, nothing that has mass, it can expand at speeds greater than the speed of light. It's only massive things that can't go faster than the speed of light. As it expanded and cooled, things like quarks and then baryons, leptons, photons, neutrinos, and particles of dark matter all came into existence. But at the very start, the universe didn't have particles. And so things like uh, um, um, the, the uh, phase transition that would lead to a big enough universe to have us all in it, the inflationary universe, might very well have happened. So people can propose those theorems, theories and we can start looking for them. So these are the kinds of things that people are struggling to come out with. All of which becomes possible because general relativity allows us to go back and look at that sort of thing. 
But there has to be another force, one of which is called the force of the Big Bang itself. Something started the expansion. Whatever it might have been, we, we may never know. But anyway, something had to overcome the, the, the tiny nothing that was the universe, let the expansion begin, let the inflation get going, and eventually come to a universe that's big enough to, to include us. And after all, whatever universe we're going to have has to have us in it, because we are in it, and we are able to contemplate. We are able to contemplate uh, a, a, a universe. So we're here. We might call it dark energy. It seems that dark energy is, is something that's part of the universe. Most of the universe is dark energy. And it seems to be what's responsible for accelerating the expansion. Einstein started the process of thinking about this. It's far from over because new observations such as the acceleration have to be taken into account. But that's the excitement of science. And it's a continued uh, pursuit of the truth. Now, beyond science, I need to take a few more minutes. It's very important. While he was in Prague uh, with those guys I, that I mentioned before, he actually became a pacifist. And it was a problem for him in wartime Germany in World War I. Uh, his fame led him to other interests, particularly a voice for Jews who were being discriminated against and persecuted in Germany. Uh, as I said, he was not a religious Jewish person. He was a Jew by culture, by background, and what have you. And he was very distressed by uh, anti-Semitism in, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. The Germans may have been more obvious about it, but they weren't alone. Uh, in 1932, he moves to the United States, works at the Advanced Studies Inst Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, he defected from pacifism in, in face of the Nazi criminality. And in 1940, he signs a letter to Roosevelt that says, you know what? Since uh, Hahn and Meitner have shown that they can split the, the uranium atom and obtain energy from it, and there is a way of proceeding from that to a chain reaction, that can lead to incredibly powerful explosives. We need to work on this project. Now, if anyone else had signed it, it would probably have gotten in, put into the, on the side of Roosevelt's desk. But it comes from Albert Einstein, the world's greatest scientist. And Roosevelt has to pay attention to it. One of the first things he does after December 7th, 1941, is contact uh, General Leslie Groves and tell him, this is your assignment. You've got to make this happen. And it starts what's called the Manhattan Project. And it leads to a complete change in how military affairs in this world are considered. You're not going to see a war like World War II ever again unless the human race decides on mutual destruction because these weapons are going to do that. I mean, it just isn't going to happen unless that, unless that uh, is in people's mind. In 1948, uh, by the way, this last line is important. Einstein never takes part in the Manhattan Project. All he ever does is write that letter. Uh, they, his, his aspect of, of theoretical physics is not related to the actual building of the bomb. So he, never is involved in it. He never goes to New Mexico. He, he doesn't even talk to, uh, to the people involved. He's, he's not connected to it. All, he need, all they needed him for was to get Roosevelt to take action. In 48, the new state of Israel offers him the presidency, and he's smart enough to realize that he's not a politician. And he doesn't want to take that role. Uh, he dies in 1955 without ever achieving a unified field theory. Um, and no one else has, has done it yet uh, since. But Einstein uh, left us with some very neat quotes. Uh, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Another is a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. 
And only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the former. So he left you with philosophy. Uh, okay, I think that's enough.